Hey guys, welcome back to the Tea Party Podcast. It's the country music podcast where you find new friends and new music. This week I'm joined by another artist who will be hitting the stage at Freedom Jam next month. And she's an artist that I've been excited to talk to for a couple of weeks now. And I'm talking about Sarah Faith. And Sarah, thank you so much for jumping on here with me. Well, thanks so much for having me. This is awesome. I'm so excited. Absolutely. And before we get too far into this, let's start by giving everybody sort of the Wikipedia version of who you are, where you came from, and how you got into music. Okay, the Wikipedia version means other people could edit it. So feel free to (laughs) change this based on if you know me better than me. Um, So I'm originally from Michigan, and we moved to Nashville, my husband and I, um, just about a year ago. It'll be a year on August 2nd. I'll celebrate my one-year Nashversary. Yeah, go us. Um, So honestly, we came down here on a little bit of a universe whim. Um, I was in a band in Michigan before we moved. And it just became clear that there were a lot of things aligning for us and uh, that we just needed to get down here. So we did that rather quickly. Um, And, you know, my main mission with with this music thing is I come from a a family that one half of it, my mom's side, is heavily involved in addiction. Um, And for some strange reason, I don't have that bug. And I think it's a little bit of a miracle a little bit of choice and also kind of my responsibility to prove that you can come from dark things and still spread light. So that's kind of what we're doing down here. Well, and you know, moving to Nashville has got to be a big thing. And we'll talk about that in a little bit, but you've been writing music and really just writing since you were pretty young, right? I mean, it started yeah. with poetry. Yes, absolutely. So uh, when I was younger, you know, five, six, seven, eight years old, and we were starting the custody battle thing between my dad and my mom. Um, my mom and I were going through a lot of counseling because they thought that would alleviate our problems more than my mother getting clean. Uh, and I don't know why they thought that. But uh, my counselors were like, well, if you have things that, that are too angry to say, and if you're having these feelings that are just kind of really building up and you really just get to your end, you know, you can try journaling and you can try drawing pictures and you can try writing you know, whatever you think. And, and I would write different poems and different stuff um, just to try to cope with everything. Cause there's a lot of things that, you know, when you're that young and you're going through that kind of stuff, um, it's not like a, a hot topic of conversation. You're not like <laughs> running around the playground, like, yo, what's going on in your life? Well, this is going on in mine. Like, no, <laughs> it never like came out of my mouth. Um, so I was just kind of left with writing about it. Um, so that's what I did for years and years and years. So, I mean, you started writing, you know, kind of journaling and poetry as a way to, to cope with some of that stuff. Is that the way that you approach your music now is with a real, a real life backstory trying to, to kind of work from that? Yeah, super real. Um, I think what I've realized is number one, I never know who's listening and I never know who needs to hear what I'm sharing. And number two, the proof of that is when I was younger, it would have been awesome if I, knew someone that was like, you know what, I know this sucks right now, but like, you're going to get through it. And they could give me examples of actually having been through it, but it was just kind of all hearsay for me. Um, and trying to just hold on and, and keep the faith. And, but I just didn't know, you know, I was just like, this is the most insane. Some of the stuff is the most insane stuff ever that I literally can't even put into sentences. How am I gonna, I'm not, I don't want to live my life this way. Um, And so I think I really take that attitude in my music um, of, yes, there was a lot of uncertainty and a lot of crazy dark times. Um, But if I can infuse that into my music and help people understand that, that hanging on is worth it and you have a purpose in this world, then, uh, then that's what I want to do. When was it that you transitioned from kind of writing to yourself, writing for yourself to writing music and picking up an instrument and putting a melody behind it? You know, I would argue that um, part of the the stuff that I'm doing is still for myself. It's still very therapeutic for me because there's some things that I say in songs that I just don't know how to put in words. Um, For instance, I have a song called Rock Bottom that's going to be on my next project. Um, And and I wrote it with my friend Bailey Ingle. And and we really were trying to put into a song things that we don't know how to put into words. I don't know how to put into words how to love someone through addiction, but I've done it a lot. And if I can figure out how to put a melody to that, it just makes more sense in music. 
Um, and I think the transition happened. I was like 13 and my dad bought me a guitar. I'm self-taught on piano as well. Um, and I think, you know, I've been involved in music pretty much my whole life. I would say I was in choir, and, <clears throat> excuse me, in middle school and high school and college. Um, and I always admired how songs told different stories. I mean, everything we were doing in choir it always told a different story. And I, I didn't think that my poems, even though they were very much about my true life, I didn't think that they were, that was very far fetched to see them as possibly stories of other people as well. Um, and you know, it's half me and half universal magic. That's just like, here, you can play the guitar and sing this poem at the same time. Boom, there you wrote a song. So it's kind of <laughs> a little bit, a little bit of magic at the same time, I think. See, that's not, that's not a bad thing to have, though. Sometimes no, it's like, sometimes totally like, not on purpose. <laughs> yeah, right? So, do you, I mean, you were involved in all of this growing up. Do you remember your first time up on stage, your first time performing? I do, but it doesn't have a whole lot to do with what I'm doing right <laughs> now. So I was, uh, it's, and it's, it's, a, it's a bittersweet story, so I'll just preface it with that. But I was like seven. And uh, I was at some kind of barn party with my mom and uh, she was drinking as usual. And um, someone broke out a karaoke machine and I hadn't known anything of karaoke before that day. Um, just didn't even think about it. Just was like a, a backseat professional radio singer, basically <laughs> in my mom's car and my dad's car or whatever, you know, just like always singing to the radio. Um, but then there was this box that played songs without the words so that you could sing the words. And uh, my mom really wanted me to sing um, Randy Travis forever and ever. Amen. And I was like, no, I don't want to sing it. No, I don't want to sing it. She was like, please, I really want you to sing this for me. And I was like, okay. Um, so once I got up, I actually realized that I didn't really want to come down. So um, I, and I guess that, that kind of, affinity for being on stage probably started in that moment if uh because i can't really remember anything earlier than that so well that's i mean that you're right that is kind of a bittersweet reason to get started but it seems a like bit. <laughs> <laughs> it seems like it's worked out so far and i think music is one of those mediums that really allows people to kind of show their true colors and be open and honest and raw but also get that direct feedback from people i mean you've got you know, you, there's very few performing arts that you get that individual type feedback with. And it seems like that's kind of how you've approached your songwriting is knowing that you're going to go up on stage and tell this story and get that, that emotional feedback from people and, and feed your emotion into it as well. Yeah, I would t definitely agree with that. And um, I really appreciate that outlook on it for sure. Um, you know, like I say, you just, you just never know who's listening. I mean, I've, played songs and had people say, Oh my gosh, like I, I really feel that to my core. Like that's, I totally understand where you're coming from. And like, thank you so much for putting that with such a, a bow on it to where like, that's, that's it. You know, that's, that's what it feels like to go through this. And I always, um, I always like to think that, you know, where words fall short, music speaks, you know, when, when I just don't, like when I'm to the end of myself and I just don't really know what to say, maybe I can throw a few words down and let the music kind of do the talking. Well, and for you, it's more than just the music. It seems like, I mean, you've got a, a blog that you keep up on your website as well. Yeah. Um, that's it's, you can tell that it's very true to who you are just kind of reading through it and, and seeing what you're saying and then talking to you now. I mean, it's, it's all the same things. And in your last blog post, there was a line that jumped out at me that seems to kind of encapsulate everything that you do and the reason that you do it. And it's, we cannot go around expecting perfection from each other. We just can't because we're humans and we're, we're not going to get it a hundred percent correct all the time or ever. And I think that is such a poignant statement, especially with what's going on right now and how everybody's always looking to the other side, whatever that may be to fix the problem, but it seems like no matter what you've done, you've always gone out there and just tried to make the best of whatever the situation is. 
Yeah. And thank you so much for reading that, by the way. It's really heartwarming to learn that people are reading these things and, and taking them for what they are. Um, it's just another small contribution that I can make from my outlook and my side of the fence. Um, and I think I learned uh, through my years with my mom and with everything going on, I tried so hard and I wasted so much energy trying to change my mom and cure her from her addiction. And that exact situation has presented itself numerous times in my life. And it might've been different people and the situation might've been a little bit different, but the only thing that is the same in every situation that just completely maddens me is that the only thing I have control over is myself. The only thing I can ever control between my mom's relationship with me and vice versa is the way that I handle it. I could have spent, I did spend a lot of time and a lot of energy wanting to change her, wishing she would change, wishing she would get sober, and it never happened. And the only thing I had control over was when I decided in college that I just couldn't have a relationship with her because it was literally ruining my life. I literally wanted to take myself from this planet. I wanted out so badly and I just needed to separate myself from that kind of energy if I wanted anything better for myself. And I had control over that. My mom certainly was never going to say, oh, well, you know, it's probably better if we don't talk. I had to say that. I had control over that. Um, so, yeah, that, that line is actually um, something that I really, really, truly believe um, as humans we just can't. I can't expect her to be a perfect mom because she just wasn't dealt that kind of knowledge or those kinds of cards. Um, but for me, I have control over myself and what I do. And for me, I choose to choose my legacy, which is like my tagline that's going on my merch that I'm rolling out. So like you're saying, like, yes, it's completely a full package thing. There's a blog, there's the songs, there's the live streams, there's the merch. Um, and it all revolves around choosing your legacy. Like I get to choose and you get to choose and we all get to choose. Um, it just does, I, I think so much, so much more impact if we just kind of focus on ourselves and, and being the right people. Well, and that's conversations like this are why I started this podcast was not just the music. I mean, I love the music side. I love helping artists get in front of other people, but what a lot of people don't realize is conversations like this obviously you and I are talking, but there's going to be somebody out there that's going to hear this, that's going to take those words to heart and it's going to help them. And I know that's why you do what you do is, you know, to help make the world just a, a little bit brighter. Thousand percent. One thousand percent. What was it that, uh, that helped or that pushed you down the country music path? Oh boy. Um, <laughs> well, you know, and I always say too that I'm, I'm a little bit country, a little bit this, a little bit that, a little bit all over the place because I just have so many musical influences and such strong rock roots. Um, you know, I'm never going to put out a song that I don't think sounds good and a lot of it probably is going to have some kind of rock background um, heavily influenced by Stevie Nicks and Bonnie Raitt um, and Grace Potter. So, you know, that right there is possibly still country, but more like rock chick. <laughs> yeah. um, and I think, uh, I just, I just still think that music was such a natural progression for me. Um, you know, a lot of times when you listen to different kinds of music, I think when you listen to pop music, it's a sound thing, maybe not necessarily always a lyric thing, although they do have some great lyrics in pop music. Um, with rock music, there's some great lyrics in rock music as well, but it's a lot about sound. It's a lot about guitar and how that feels. And I think that there's just so much story in me that I have to bring in that storyteller aspect um, in order to really make it true to me. So that's probably where the country music fits the best is that that storyteller aspect. And that, that makes sense. And I think a lot of people are kind of gravitating towards country music right now for that exact reason that it's not this hard line in the sand genre i mean you just you look at some of the biggest names out there now and none of them sound the same they've no. all got these influences that come from outside of 
country music and even yourself uh you were you talked about it a little bit um but going out with alan turner and the steel horse band i mean that's a a real kind of country rock band that's not it's not the typical country that i think most people associate when you say country music right yeah i mean when i was with alan and uh we were playing i mean we were playing everything from classic rock to modern country i mean we'd play jackson and then we'd turn around and play carrie underwood i mean it was like we were all over the place um so some traditional country yes but a lot of rock i mean you know jimmy loved his guitar solos and we had a great drummer and it was it was awesome um so that that was definitely kind of an all over the place kind of thing but alan always wore a cowboy hat so that was <laughs> That was very country. <laughs> well, and what was that experience like? I feel like it, it might have helped you learn the ropes a little bit, being out on the road with a group like that, um, maybe not taking that first leap of faith to go touring as a solo artist. I mean, there's got to be something that you that you grab from there that you can build on. Totally. Um, I was with Alan for about a year, and I will, I will credit that experience um, com- for reigniting my seven year old dream of becoming a singer. You know, when I was seven, I really wanted to be a singer. And I don't think that I knew why I wanted to, but I, I wanted to bad. Like that was the answer. What do you want to be when you grew up, Sarah? I want to be a singer. Okay, cool. That's great. Yeah, that's keep dreaming. You know, like that's kind of what happens. And then I had to let that dream die because there was no path to that with how I was brought up. It was like survival mode for like, 10 years. And then I got to college and I played soccer and I got a degree and then I got a master's and I was going to work in sports my whole life. Cause that's what made sense to me. Um, and so I was, and then I was just kind of on this path of graphic design and being a photographer and just doing all these different things and nothing fit quite right. I mean, I loved them, but I didn't love them. Um, and so then I, I was out singing karaoke and, and one of Alan's friends asked me if I wanted to audition for this band and I totally thought she was kidding, but she wasn't. Um, and so I auditioned and, and got the job and, and got the chance to play at some really amazing places. I mean, we played the Fillmore in Detroit. We played Jimmy John's Stadium, uh, which is a new um, baseball stadium that they just built in the Detroit area. We just had a chance to do some really cool things and I was like, you know, this is still the dream. It might have been 20 years ago that I dreamed this, but this is still the dream. Well, and you move, you moved from that down to Nashville. How much different is Nashville as a musician than it was being in the Detroit area? You know, I can sum it up in a pretty small answer, which is hard for me to do. <laughs> uh, Detroit, if you're good at what you do, you get to be a big fish in a small pond. In Nashville, if you're good at what you do, it doesn't matter because you're still a small fish in a huge pond. And that's just, that's just kind of how it is. And I don't mind it that way. I I really like it. I I prefer to be a little fish in a big pond, I think. That is an incredible way to put that because (laughs) I, I think it's spot on. It really is. I mean, I've probably asked some version of that question to 15 or 20 different people. And I think that may be the best answer that, that I've heard for that. Because it's I'll go ahead and put that on my resume then, Ty. Go. I'll go ahead and let people know that if you want to know a comparison of the music industry, your girl's got you. you, go. <laughs> you go. well, no, I mean, I think it's true. I mean, I think I, I, I could have stayed in Detroit. I would have been, you know, happy in Detroit. I could have just, you know, stayed there and, and done and, you know, just kept doing what I was doing and, and, and whatever. Um, but I just, I just really felt like there was – something else pulling and my husband would agree with you we were just like random people were asking me when are you going to do a solo thing when are you going to go are you going to go to nashville and i was like why would you that's just the most random question you could ever ask someone like no i didn't really put much thought into it but now that you mention it i guess you're the fifth person this week and i guess i should move to nashville I mean, that's one way to do it you just listen to the universe and, and see what happens you know and i think that's Honestly, the best way to do it, there was a lot of fear involved. There was a lot of second guessing involved. We were like, what if this doesn't work? My husband didn't have a job. We didn't have a house. The house that we live in right now, we took a tour through it on FaceTime and I'm not kidding. Like we just literally 
flew by the seat of our pants and everything has worked out because we told the universe we were all in. We said, okay, we're hearing these dreams coming from the universe. They sound a little crazy, but they don't sound completely offbeat and they really light my soul on fire. So screw it. Let's do it. And we did it. And, and I've just like, you just keep jumping and jumping and jumping. And the more you jump into that kind of fear, the crazier shit you end up doing. And it's just, you just keep doing it, you know? Well, and I'm a big believer in fate. I mean, if something's supposed to happen, it will happen. And, you know, it just sounds like through your journey, that's kind of how you've lived it is you wait for the universe to say, okay, here's, here's the fork in the road, pick where you're going to go with it. Yeah. And you gotta, you gotta be all in. You gotta tell the universe I'm all in, you know, we sold our house, we bought a house. We're all in like now we're screwed. You know, <laughs> now we got to find a moving company, blah, blah. And I think too, you can tell me if you agree with this, but don't you think that when the universe has something, has some work for you to do and has a purpose for you, it kind of just keeps giving you these little like annoying pinches in the face until you actually decide that you're going to do it. It's like, you should maybe do this and you're like, okay, enough. I get it. Like, do you think that's true or no? Oh, absolutely. I mean, <laughs> my, the story that I always tell people it is like when I was getting into media and TV and radio and that sort of thing, I'd been toying with it for a while. I'd had a couple of interviews. I'd moved around a bit. And then, um, I live in Spokane, which is in Eastern Washington. My wife's family is in the Seattle area. So we had driven over there for just a visit. And my absolute favorite radio show that I've listened to growing up was on. And we were driving over the, the mountain pass. And I turned to my wife and I said, you know what? There, there's been enough of this. I've, I've looked at it enough. I've had enough interviews. And I think radio, TV, media, that's the way that I want to go. And we came down the other side of the pass and probably 45 minutes after this conversation, I got a call from the news director in Spokane about an application I had put in nine months before mm -hmm. saying, Hey, we want you to come in uh, for an interview two days from now. But you never until that moment told the universe that you were all in. Exactly. And then once you did, boom, it all happened. Like, that is an amazing story. I really love that. Because, you know, they've had your application for nine months. What happened in month number three or five or seven? Exactly. But you had to tell me you're all in. Yep. So you just, you got to verbalize it. Yeah, totally. So coming up, um, I want to talk to you a little bit about Freedom Jam, which is happening next month. Uh, but before that, I want everybody to kind of hear your style and your music. And you sent over a song um, that I believe is your debut single, right? That's correct. So it's called the uh, Before You, and it just came out at the end of May. And obviously, with COVID and all of that, it's changed the plans of some people, um, especially when it comes to releasing music. But how did it affect when you put out this song? I mean, was it something that you had been planning on putting out at that time specifically for a while, or did that push it up a little bit? You know, um, we started working on this song in February, and um, I I tried my best to just have the attitude of when this is ready to come out, it'll come out. When I, I don't have a release date in mind, I try my hardest not to put my dreams in boxes because I want to leave room for them to just be wild and go wherever they want to go. Um, so we were, we recorded the song and then we were trying to find a time to do the vocal and COVID happened and whatever. Um, we finished production on it and I was like, okay, fine. May 29th. It's, nine days after my dad's birthday and a couple days before my own birthday. That seemed like a good idea. Um, and I was, I had zero expectations for how it was going to perform, zero expectations for what it was going to do on iTunes or Spotify or whatever. I, I also try not to get my mind too involved in numbers because I think that's just disappointment waiting to happen. And I don't need that. <laughs> um, so I just think that I just, I just let it, I just let it do what it needed to do. Um, and, you know, some people have grabbed onto it and loved it and they've streamed it and I've been super thankful. Um, and it just kind of, I've also heard some people that, that don't quite live by that mentality. They're a little spoofed by that mentality. And they're like, you know, I made this project and I decided to release it right in the middle of April or right in the middle of May, right when COVID was happening. It was the worst idea ever. And for me, I struggle to see that viewpoint because I think like, People are sitting on their hands at home doing nothing. 
what better thing to do than to give them some cool Absolutely. music to listen to? Here, take this, listen to it, stream it. I don't care. Put it on repeat. Do your workouts to it. I don't know, but you've got nothing else better to do, so here. <laughs> that's, and that's a great way to look at it. And just no. outside, I've been, I think I've been a little bit baffled that more people haven't taken that path because you've got artists that had these full stadium tours mm-hmm. that don't get to happen. I mean, the least that you know they could do is release those songs they're waiting to release until it was tour time i mean give people something out there to- yeah why not i mean we were supposed to see chris stapleton we had so many we we're concert junkies we were supposed to see dave matthews band which would have been my husband's like probably oh. 90th show he loves dmb and it just didn't happen but dave matthews has done so much home streaming and so much giving we're just like this is amazing it's so cool it, it really is i mean it's been a very innovative time for a lot of artists out there, I think. Yes. So with this song before you, how did it come about? Give us kind of the story about writing the song and and where it came from. Oh boy, the backstory (laughs) of the debut. Um, Okay, so I had gotten networked and hooked up with a wonderful group down here in Nashville called Golden West. Uh, Britt and Nash, they're a, a country pop group from LA, but they live in Nashville these days. And, um, we were meeting on a Friday, it was last October, I believe. And uh, we were like, oh, well, you know, we're both, we're all in kind of this kind of cool Friday mood. Let's just write a, write a fun Friday jam. So Britt came up with the kind of the dun, dun, dun little guitar hook. And we were like, oh, that's kind of sweet. And we just kind of started singing some random syllables to it and came up with B for you. And we were like, what does that even mean? Sometimes you just, you hear syllables to songs and you don't know what they mean. And that's half the fun of it is trying to decipher what song is in the room or, you know, what everyone's hearing and that kind of thing. So then I started thinking, you know, before you that I could selfishly weave my own story into this and kind of hijack this songwriting situation. (laughs) Uh, So I will throw myself under the bus for that one, but it turned out okay. Um, And I just thought like, um, before I met Ryan, I was in a just sequence of not awesome relationships. Um, you know, you name it. I, I had some people that were slamming doors and punching holes in walls and cops were called and involved. And, you know, there was infidelity and there was just all kinds of stuff going on that I was like, man, like if this is what relationships are like, I don't want any part of them. Cause you know, I, my parents were divorced and I was like, everyone who seems to be in a relationship is unhappy. And I know I'm terribly unhappy. So I would just rather be alone, you know? I'd rather just kind of be in charge of my own happiness. Um, But then this guy comes up to me in a bar randomly, least expected it, and he goes, hey, how you doing? And uh, we are still together four and a half years later. And um, and so Before You is the story of it just happens when you least expect it and your life goes from dim to full color when you meet the right person and you just don't know when it's going to be and it sucks it sucks to like play the waiting game but sometimes you just got to do it and uh and that's that's kind of it in a nutshell well here it is let's let everybody take a listen to it it's the debut single from sarah faith it's called before you perfect yeah i thought that it was perfect it wasn't working i was wasting all my time So damn certain That I would never find Something worth it Someone worth it I was in a Couldn't see the stars at night Couldn't count the fireflies Take a living kind of mood Before you Those neon lights didn't shine as bright Never realized that my whole life Could be summarized in a world Across the room, hypnotize me. Staring in those baby blues, couldn't fight it. It was something so familiar, we can't deny it. No, we can't deny it. Now, how can this be possible with someone that?
and that was Sarah Faith's debut single, Before You. And if you're in the St. Louis area, Sarah will be taking part in Freedom Jam on August 29th in St. Peter's, Missouri. And it's a pretty cool event. I sat down with Brian Judy, uh, the organizer, a couple of weeks ago. You can hear him and the uh, headliners, Walker County, a couple of episodes back. But Sarah, what is it about Freedom Jam and Operation Triage that, that was so important for you to get involved? You know, I am, being that I'm such a, a creator of this meaningful music thing that I've got going, I'm a fan of using music for good. And I think that's what Brian Judy is doing with this event. Um, so he came across me and asked me if I wanted to be a part of it. And obviously, um, I had never met him before. And I was just, I was so impressed with what he was doing with this, with this event that, his, that he's created. Um, and I, I think it's an amazing, amazing reason that he's doing this. Um, so I was all in. He asked me, you know, would you want to play a few songs? Would you want to sing the national anthem? And I was like, dude, you're, that would be amazing. I mean, I'm, I'm humbled. I'm honored. I, I would love to, to join in something that's, you know, fighting for such an important cause. Well, and he's done a good job of, of organizing. And it sounds like he's, you know, done such a good job that he's already got stuff booked out for next year and the tickets are going fast i i'm not even sure if when this comes out on tuesday that there's going to be any tickets left last i saw it was less than 50 so yeah right now there's like 45 tickets or something like that so people you gotta get on yeah especially if you're in the st louis area don't miss out on freedom jam because it's going to be a fantastic thing we'll make sure to leave a link in the uh in the description of this episode just in case but sarah outside of freedom jam what else do you have in store for the rest of 2020? Well, for the rest, I, mm, this is a hard question and you know, it. <laughs> this isn't fair and you know it. Um, I think for the rest of 2020, um, what I've got my sight set on right now is just, I, I'm trying my hardest not to get too excited about trying to share music in ways that involve I don't want to say involve others because that's not true, but I just don't want to start thinking about venues and personnel and get disappointed. Um, so I'm just kind of mentally holding off on trying to make plans and trying to make things like that happen. Um, what I am doing though is um, I've been doing weekly live streams on Instagram for a few months now during COVID. Um, and it's called Peeling Back the Layers. And I do that because I share my songs, my guitar, and my stories that are behind them. Um, and I, tr I did that to kind of create a space for if, if anyone should log on to that stream and be like, you know, I'm just having a day. And I just want to feel like I can go someplace and just have a day and, and kind of be honest about that. Because like last night I did, it's, it happens on Wednesday nights. So last night I had a day and I popped in and I was like, guys, I'm just really tired. And I just, I just need that to be okay. And that's kind of the space that I'm trying to create with that. Um, and then I started doing them on Facebook and YouTube on Tuesday nights. Um, so there's that kind of evolution, but what I, what I ultimately am trying to create is, um, a community that happens kind of off of social media in more of a zoom setting where people can grab a ticket that's, you know, pretty cheap and come hang out for an hour and just ask me questions about my songs, ask me questions about my journey and um, really kind of combine mindset and music together. I'm calling it meaningful music because everything needs a cool coined phrase these days. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just trying to, to just be a light where light is needed um, and just, and just try to, take what I have and use it as, as, as eloquently and as well as I know how in as many ways as I know how to help in various directions. Well, and where can people find you on social media to, to be a part of the group? You can, um, I'm all over Instagram. That's where I spend most of my time. I am a, a wannabe Facebooker, but I'm trying my hardest. Uh, I'm also, I don't want to say a wannabe YouTuber because just the YouTube world works differently. So, um, there's cover videos. I do probably more cover stuff on YouTube, but I post all my original stuff on there as well. So it's not like a cover fest. 
it's just not, that doesn't really ring true to me as an artist. I don't do a ton of covers. Um, but yeah, so Instagram, Sarah Faith underscore music, Facebook, just Sarah Faith music, YouTube, Sarah Faith. Um, and then I have a website as well, sarahfaithmusic.com. And that's actually where you can go to find the tickets to my live stream. So I've got like, if you go to the top where it says shows, you can click on the live stream. It'll take you directly to the page where you can grab a ticket. Well, we will make sure to put that link in the description as well. And Sarah, it's been fantastic and we can't let you go yet. We end every podcast the same way. Uh, We call it the final four and it's probably the four toughest questions that I'm going to ask just because they make you think. Okay. Even harder than the, what are your plans for 2020? That one got me. I think so. I think some of these (laughs) might get you. Okay. I feel like I'm in an interview and like um, when I was younger, someone asked me, if you could be one cartoon character, what would you be? And I was like, SpongeBob. I don't know. It was random. (laughs) He's like, this is a really hard question. I'm like, okay. Well, here, let's see if I can make you think with any of these. The first one is, if you could go on tour with anybody, alive or dead, who would it be? Ashley McBride. Oh, that was Hands down. That's the live answer. Dead, well... I don't know if anyone that I want to go on tour with is dead, but also Chris Stapleton, also Grace Potter. They're all very alive and well. The, okay, those are three solid choices, actually. Thank and you so quick. <laughs> well, I just, I know who I love, man. I, I am inspired by Ashley and Chris and Grace every single day, and I just, those are my roots. Like, that's, that's, where, that's where I live. Okay, how about this one? Where were you and who were you with? The first time you heard your music being played by somebody that wasn't you, you know, at a bar, at a party. Um, okay, well, I don't think anyone's played my music yet. Um, you mean like playing it like live or playing it like a recording? Just like a recording. Like if you walked into oh. a bar and it was, it was playing or something like that. Well, okay, so there's, there's two... I know that you asked what's the first time there's one it one time it was a demo that I had made but then there was another time when it was the actual release so I was at a songwriters round for my good friend Coley Kohler and she was playing my demos over the speakers and I was talking with Ryan and my friend Kent and I was like holy shit this is my song I was like blown away but to one up that, I I was fortunate to be allowed a world premiere on Radio Sobro, which is an independent radio station in Nashville. And they were like, we're going to play your song at 10 a.m. on Thursday before the debut of your single, and it's going to be really cool. And I was like, okay, yeah, that's great. So I was in the car, and I tuned in, and I hear this drum roll. Brrr, and I was with my husband. And um, I was instagram living at the same time because i wanted to see like what my reaction would be i knew that i was going to be ridiculous and i hear for the first time ever here's sarah faith her debut single before you this intro thing and i had recorded like a little radio spot hi i'm sarah faith and this is my new single blah blah and i was like oh my god what is happening and then it started playing and i was like i can't believe that's me singing i can't believe it came together you know there's so many times that you think that the tunnel is ending and it's saying turn around go back you shouldn't be here blah blah but i just keep going and i just keep trying to keep going and hearing my song in on my radio i was like holy crap like we are doing this i mean that's got to be a pretty a pretty big sign just for yourself that hey i'm moving in the right direction yes i would wholeheartedly agree with that like for every doubt filled day, every time I'm like, what am I doing? Like something usually happens where it's like, no, this is the plan. This is what you need to be doing. Okay. How about this question? Number three, what is your favorite venue that you've ever played in? Favorite venue I've ever played in probably the Fillmore, even though I wasn't playing solo. Um, I was with my band. Um, and Outside of that, um, I, I play, um, I've played a couple times downtown Dixon where we live and, uh, I've gotten to know the owners of this cute little hole in the wall bar, downtown Dixon, Sharon and Dan Smith. And I, I love playing there. I love playing in like small little, like hometown feely things. Cause I just think 
you know, that's where I'm from. Like, if I can make a believer out of these people, I can make a believer out of anyone. I love it. Okay, here we go. Last one. What is your favorite onstage memory? Favorite onstage memory? Oh, <laughs> I don't know if I want to call myself out for this, but I guess I probably should. So... <laughs> It's just the first thing that came to mind. I probably have a laundry list of this. We could be here until tomorrow talking about my favorite onstage memories. But my, <laughs> it was when I was playing at the Fillmore. I got all dolled up. You know, I did my makeup all fancy. And I, I had my hair all long and curled. And I was also wearing um, hair extensions because my hair is super long. But I just wanted to go all out. I wanted it to be a little thicker. And it's just girl stuff that you wouldn't understand, Ty. Um, so I've got my hair extensions in and I'm playing guitar and I'm feeling good. And, uh, my husband's in the audience and he's taking a video and I, I watched the video later and I hear this lady, he's taking video and he's singing along to the songs and this lady next to him goes, do you know her? And he goes, yeah, that's my wife. She goes, oh, she has the most beautiful hair I've ever seen. Is it real? <laughs> And my husband goes, yeah, yeah, it's real. And just totally lied for me. And I, I just, I don't know. I just think that's so funny because I just, if you see me on Instagram or you see me, like if you could see my face right now, like I'm not wearing any makeup. I don't wear makeup all the time. I don't do my hair all the time. Like I just let myself kind of be myself. And especially in Corona, like what do I have to get dressed up for? Nothing. Um, and it's just funny when people are like, is her hair real? And then you have to kind of lie and be like, this is the one time that her hair is not real. You know? See, that's how you know you got yourself a good husband, though. He's Oh, he's yeah. Dreadful. Oh, yeah. I, I have the best husband. I'm going to go on, on record and say that. Well, Sarah, thank you so much. It's been such a blast. And uh, we'll have to do it again down the road. Ty, thank you so much for having me. This has been amazing. I'm, I'm so just blessed and, and lucky to have had the opportunity to hang out with you today. Yeah, well, well, we'll definitely do it again. That was another episode of the Tea Party Podcast. It's a country music podcast where you find new friends and new music like Sarah Faith and Before You. 